Right, hello everyone. Welcome to the final module of this course. So we've gone over a lot over the preceding semester, giving you guys a lot of information because this is your terminal structures course for the aerospace engineering curriculum at Illinois Tech. So I feel I've got to give you a lot of things that you otherwise wouldn't have had within this, well, within this entire degree course. So we've gone over a lot and it's all been geared up to give you an insight into the problems that we face as aerospace engineers and the tools that we use to solve problems. So today I'm gonna to go through just a quick overview of what we've spoken about so far and I'm gonna introduce the basis of this final module. It's gonna be a lot of writing today, a lot of sort of theory about what we're going to cover and then over the following lectures that come after this, we're gonna go into a lot of theory, a few examples, and I'll tell you about the things that I'm gonna test you for in this module. I wasn't getting when I said it was going to be a lot of writing today. But so far, we've explored the basic structural design of aircraft, and I say here at the top level, because we're not looking at detailed design. We've looked at what's in the wing. We've got spar, ribs, we've got skin, and then we looked at the difference between monocoque, semi-monocoque, and truss structures. And then within those different things that we have in the wing and in the, in the fuselage, we sort of have an idea about the form and function of different aircraft structural components. So we had the idea that the spars there to withstand bending, ribs are there to maintain the aircraft shape and to transfer the load from the skin to the spars. And then the skin itself is what maintains that pressure difference that actually causes the aircraft to, you know, to, to produce lift, to keep the aircraft in the sky. So a focus has been placed on the wing. Primarily because wings are so very important for aircraft. And we understood the wings basically got to, to maintain that, well, it's got to be able to withstand the forces, the pressure difference from above and below it that we call lift, okay? Um, or the forces that are actually the combined circulatory and viscous forces that give rise to lift and drag. So the wing has to be able to take those forces, transfer them to the, to the fuselage, and we sort of understand how that's been done so far. So we also understand that when we have any sort of structure that's got non, but well, it's got finite stiffness, that doesn't have an infinite stiffness, if we subject it to a force, there will be a deformation. I just put there because the wings are so important. So we also know, like I just said, that when we have any sort of non-finite, sorry, a, any sort of finite stiffness in a structure, meaning that it's flexible, then we subject it to a load, there will be an accompanying deformation.
Okay, so these the wing is subject sorry the wing is subject to the aerodynamic force loads that keep our aircraft in the sky, and these aerodynamic forces must be accompanied by some sort of deformation. So we know that the wing on an aircraft is likely to bend because we're going to have a a well Spitfire is a lovely example because it has a lovely elliptical list distribution distribution. It's going to have a tendency for the wing to bend upwards, and it's also going to be accompanied by a torsional moment called because by the pitching moment. Um, and the distance from the, the aerodynamic center to the flexural axis or the elastic axis. So the wing is going to deform. So the things that we've spoken about so far that have helped us cover this, we covered So, so far we have introduced the concept of shear center for a two-dimensional section. So we can remember that the shear center for a two-dimensional section is the point in a section at which if we apply a shear load we only get a bending deformation, we don't get any torsional deformation. And accordingly, it's the point on a two-dimensional section. If we load anywhere else, the section will have a tendency to twist around the shear center. So then the 3D analog of that would be a line connecting, or the th sorry, let's say the 3D extension of the concept of shear center. A line connecting those shear centers through a wing is the elastic axis. Okay, I'm not going to draw the diagram for this now because we covered it right back in module one. So you guys should have that in your notes already. So we've introduced this idea of shear center and it's because it's going to be important for the two problems we're going to look at in, in static aeroelasticity. So this is going to be really important for us looking at torsional divergence and the concept of control reversal. It's also very, very important for a, for a concept called wing flutter. We're going to introduce the idea of that, but we're not actually going to solve a wing flutter problem in this course because it's just too complicated for this course. Okay. We are going to have a look at something called panel flutter though. That's going to be interesting. Then we sort of moved on and we looked at this idea of work energy methods. So we have introduced this idea of work energy methods on truss structures because it helps us to develop some sort of relationship between loading and deformation without being too caught up with the underlying geometry. We also introduced the concept of virtual work, which is gonna be really important for understanding problems in aeroelasticity. And then once we got on there, we did the very basis of finite element methods, sorry, finite element methods for truss frames.
So this enabled up to set, sorry, enabled us to set up systems of equations in the form KQ equals, let's make these capital, sorry, they should be capital. Okay, so we were able to set things up like this and we said we had a stiffness matrix that gave us the relationship between our displacements, our displacement vector, and the forces on the right hand side. So this formulation here, we're going to see in a little moment, or not, maybe probably next lecture, that when we set up a panel problem, a panel flutter problem, we get something very similar here. We also end up with a mass matrix over here, so we have something called a mass matrix, and then the acceleration vector. Okay, so we're going to produce this, and we just add a little bit on there to help us look at the structural dynamics, and we're going to be looking at this problem. So the reason I'm, I'm going through all of this is because I want to show that everything we've done has been building up to enable us to understand the methods used and the problems that we look at in aeroelasticity. So all of this development has been here to help us understand flexible aircraft. So all of the proceeding so you might think it was here just to torture you. That was just an added bonus. So all of the proceeding has been in order to facilitate the understanding of how flexible aircraft behave. So the study of flexible aircraft is called aeroelasticity, and that's what this module is all about. So the study of flexible aircraft is aeroelasticity and this final module will serve as a brief sort of introduction to the discipline and we're going to look at three types of aeroelastic phenomena. So the three different aeroelastic phenomena that we're going to be looking at, we are going to look at torsional divergence. Now torsional divergence is one that we spoke about right at the start of the course. This is the idea that with an increasing aerodynamic load on an aircraft wing, we have an increasing, we have an increasing nose up pitching moment. If we have an increasing nose up pitching moment, there's going to be an increasing nose up torsional deformation, which increases the angle of attack, which increases the pitching moment. So this is a positive feedback occurring within the structure. So at some critical speed, this, the, for, sorry, the forces and the stiffness of the wing are no longer able to be in equilibrium and the wing will snap off, basically. Okay, so torsional divergence is the idea that at a certain speed, the wings will catastro sorry, catastrophically snap off.
So for this problem, we're gonna look at torsional divergence. We're gonna build a wing model, a mathematical model that's gonna help us look at the relationship between aircraft speed and the deformation in torsion of a wing. And then when we're gonna look at this problem, we're gonna see that we're gonna get a singularity at a certain point, and that's gonna give us the speed at which torsional divergence occurs. And that tells you, don't fly my aircraft that fast. We're then gonna develop that model a little bit to look at a problem called control reversal. Let's say control reversal, and let's stop writing over the same point several times. These are two sort of related phenomena. Aileron effectiveness is sort of a sub part of understanding the concept of control reversal. Um, most of you guys in this course are aerospace engineers. I know I've got a few mechanicals with me. Ailerons are the control surfaces on the wings that are operated in differential mode, such that if you want the aircraft to roll, the ailerons affect a roll rate by increasing the lift on one wing, reducing the lift on the other. So if I want to have the aircraft turn to, I've got a, I'm in reverse now. So for you guys, that looks like it's rolling to the starboard side. For my aircraft roll starboard side, I move my stick to the right, and that causes the aircraft to roll in that direction. Now, as the aircraft gets faster, we'll find that due to the flexibility of the wings, the relationship between the roll rate affected, so the roll rate produced by turning the stick to the right, will not be as great as the speed increases because the wings themselves deform, and we're gonna look at that. And at a certain speed, the aileron has no, has no effect at all, okay? Or the moving the stick to the left and the right doesn't cause a roll rate, and then beyond that speed, we'll find actually, we have to move the stick in the other direction to get the desired aircraft motion. Very similar thing happens here with the elevator as well. This aircraft here is actually missing one of its elevators, but a very similar, was well, very missing one half of its elevator, I should say. Very similar thing happens with the elevator on there. So at a certain speed, pilot may find that if the, we've gone beyond the elevator control reversal speed to pull up, they would have to push the stick forward. And that's gotta be a real, I don't wanna say the phrase I wanted to say, but that's gotta be a real confusion for any pilot. So we're gonna look at those. Um, I've just described those, but let's say control reversal, speed, at which controls are reversed. So we're going to look for that, and the aileron effectiveness, this is sort of the thing that causes this to happen. Aileron becomes less effective to the point that it becomes so ineffective that it's going the other direction. And then the last problem we're going to look at, we're actually going to look at this one first. We're going to look at a dynamic phenomena called flutter. So aerodynamic flutter. Now, flutter is a catastrophic combined bending and torsion vibration of an aircraft wing or other control surface that is aerodynamically positively damped. And what that means is that the aerodynamic forces excite this vibration. And then within two to three seconds, aircraft wings will vibrate to the point that they snap off completely. So this is a catastrophic phenomena.
Okay, so what I've written here is it's a catastrophic phenomena whereby where a combined bending torsion vibration is excited by aerodynamic loads, such that within two to three seconds the wing aerodynamic surface goes from quiet, nothing happening, to missing because it's snapped off. And I said it was positively damped by aerodynamics, I didn't really mean that. I mean it's negatively damped in that the aerodynamic forces cause the vibration to increase in amplitude very, very quickly. So two to three seconds at a, above a certain speed, the wings will snap off or the horizontal control surface will snap off. Now we're gonna look at models for these two mathematically within this course. These are what we call um, static aeroelastic phenomenon. This one here is a dynamic aeroelastic phenomenon. Now we can't in this course come up with a mathematical model for flutter because it requires us to look at unsteady aerodynamics. I'd love to go through that. I'd love to be able to go through the using Theodorson's model for unsteady aerodynamics, but it's just too much to fit into this course. But instead, we're gonna look at another form of flutter that is panel flutter. Panel flutter occurs on supersonic missiles and on rockets. So we're gonna look at a flutter of the panel or the panels of a rocket basically. And we're gonna be going through that and you'll see that we're gonna use all of these things in producing that, um, except the shear center, because that's just a wing thing really. But we're gonna use work energy methods and then we're gonna use the finite element, sort of finite element, we are gonna be using matrix methods to set a problem up like this for panel flutter. And then for these two problems, we're gonna to need to understand what shear center is because that's gonna help us develop the idea of how aerodynamic loads affect the pitching moment and then the pitching deformation of a wing. Cool, so let's talk about aeroelasticity. So fundamental to aeroelasticity is this interplay between three different types of forces, inertial, aerodynamic, and structural, or we'll say elastic forces. And these are, these are described really well in a diagram called Collar's Triangle. And I had to look up today who Collar was. Um, I knew he was obviously a famous aerodynamicist, but he was, an aer well, he, was a, he was a scientist and mathematician called Arthur Collar. And he was a British scientist, so I, mean, I was proud about that. He laid LAID, he wasn't a chicken, he laid the I might be L-A-Y, I don't know. Someone can correct me on the English there. So Arthur Colley was a British scientist who laid the fundamental theory that would underpin aeroelastic theory through to the present day and beyond. So he um, produced something called Colley's Triangle and we still use it to this day just to describe the fundamental basis of how all these different forces interact.
Again, there's lots of different versions of this diagram online. You'll see them described in different ways. Um, have, a, have a search, see what you can find. I'm going to draw my own here. They're all fundamentally the same, the way these diagrams work. But the three forces, we've got aerodynamic forces. So those are lift, drag, and pitching moments. We've got inertial forces. So those are ones related to the fact that our aircraft components have mass. And then we've got elastic forces. And those are the ones that are related to stiffness. So the triangle goes between these. And this tells us that if we have a problem involving all three of these, aerodynamic forces, inertial forces, and elastic forces, then we have dynamic aeroelasticity. And then the problems that we, uh, we look at there are flutter that we've described already, and then buffet is something that also occurs on aircraft. We're not actually gonna look at buffet if you want to know more about it, I advise you to do some reading. Okay, so these ones here, we've also got other forces that are other problems that just involve two of them, for example. So if we have a an aircraft problem that's just relating the fact that the aircraft is flexible and the aerodynamic forces, but is not time dependent, so we don't have to look at the way the acceleration of components that have mass behave, and we don't have to invoke Newton's Newton second law. Then we've got static aeroelasticity, which is up here. So static aeroelasticity, the problems that we're going to look at here are the ones I've already described. We're going to be looking at torsional divergence and control reversal. torsional divergence and control reversal. If we were just looking at elastic forces on their own, then we'd be looking at structural mechanics. If we were just looking at inertial forces and how things move due to the fact we've got mass, then we'd either be looking at structural dynamics or aircraft dynamics. So we'll just put dynamics down here. If we're looking at the fact that we've got a flexible structure that has mass and has stiffness, then this just gives rise to mechanical vibration. And then this other one up here, if we've just got inertial forces, so i.e. the aircraft has mass and we've got aerodynamic forces, then we've got aircraft flight dynamics. And we call this rigid body dynamics. Let's draw a better set of braces than that. And you'll be covering this next semester in aircraft flight mechanics. Okay, and that's what I'm really trying to hit at here. If we want to look at what a flexible aircraft does, then we've got to look at all of these effects together. We've got to look at the fact there are aerodynamic forces, which are inherently unsteady as well. So we have both steady forces and unsteady. And I don't think at this point in your uh, in your academic careers you've looked at unsteady aerodynamics yet. What do I mean by unsteady aerodynamics? Well, this is the fact that if we have an angle of attack that's a function of time, then your CL does not simply equal your lift curve slope multiplied by your angle as a function of time, okay? 
we've got hysteresis, which is a time delay. We've got things called impulsive lift because you've got your accelerating air. Basically, unsteady aerodynamics just complexify everything that we're looking at. And I say complexify, that's a useful word to have accidentally misused because we often use complex numbers to look at unsteady aerodynamics. Okay, so if we were to look at that, then we'd need to invoke a whole other branch of mathematics that I don't want to get into. But the re again, the reason I bring this up is because I'm showing that aeroelasticity is the bee's knees of cool subjects you can study because it captures all of these other things. It captures really rigid body dynamics, which is part of flight mechanics. It covers, it incorporates mechanical vibration and it incorporates this idea of static aeroelasticity. So we're mainly going to look at this stuff in this course. We're going to look at torsional divergence and control reversal, but we are going to look at a problem involving dynamical, dynamic aeroelasticity. So we're going to look at a rocket panel flutter problem. Okay, let's just have a quick discussion about where some of these forces come from and how we can start to incorporate them in our models. And then that'll be the end of this introduction and I'll move on to the next lecture for tomorrow. So we're going to consider an aircraft wing. And we've produced this diagram many times in this course, but let's just remind ourselves of the things that are important. So we have an aircraft wing, I've got say an aileron down here. Then I could draw effectively the point at which the aerodynamic center of all of these sections is, and if I've got a, a rectangular wing, then this would just be a straight line along the quarter chord. So let's draw this on. So I could draw on my aerodynamic center. I could also draw on the point at which the aircraft would bend around. So if I was to draw a line through all of the shear centers of these sections, then I could draw that on here. That will be my elastic axis. And I could also, if I could work out where the center of mass of all of these parts were, I could draw a line through those as well. And let's say that it's constant for this wing. Let's call this the inertial axis. Now this is the only one we've actually not covered so far. So we're going to briefly define what the inertial axis is. If my elastic axis is a line joining all of the torsional or shear centers of all of these sections, then the inertial axis is exactly the same thing, but joining the center of gravity of all of these sections. And you just remember aerodynamic center is the point at which the aircraft pitching moment is independent of angle of attack. Okay, not the same as center of pressure. Um, let's just remember that definition there. You guys should have that from 312 already, I think. Elastic axis, well, we've already covered what this is. The elastic axis is a line through the shear center of, of the wing. Um, for a typical wing section, it's normally between about point, anywhere between 0.3 and 0.5 of the chord going from zero to one. So a typical wing. Okay, so 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 C, where C is the chord. Okay, so zero up here, one down here. And for a closed section, it's always going to be inside the wing. So that's useful for us. So let's think about some of the forces that occur on the aircraft. Now, if we have the aerodynamic center ahead of the inertial axis, as I've drawn here, we have, we have a static bending problem.
static bending and torsion. So if I was to take one of these sections out, let's say through here, take this section out, let's draw that line better. Let's say down here. Okay, so I've taken my wing cross section out. I've got my aerodynamic center and I've got my elastic axis. I could also draw the um, inertial axis, but if I've just got static bending and I've got no vibration, I've got no time dependent movement, then I don't need to worry about the center of gravity. Okay, so we can appreciate that if I've got my lift acting at the aerodynamic center, then I've got this distance that is between the elastic axis and the AC, and that's gonna be equal to the elastic margin, which we've already, already described as EC. So the distance between the aerodynamic center and the elastic axis is the static margin, and this gives us the moment arm between the lift that's acting on the wing and the point about which it's going to cause torsion. So this then gives rise to the pitching moment that's going to cause the wing to deform. So we can probably appreciate that if I've got my aircraft and it is flying along at some nominal angle of attack with velocity u, then this is going to cause a lift. Well, that lift is not actually drawn. I've drawn sort of normal force here. If I was drawing lift, I should have drawn it in that direction, really. But we can use the small angle assumption to say basically I've got lift acting in this direction and in fact we'll do that later. We can probably appreciate that this is going to cause this aerofoil to pitch up in this direction. It's gonna cause it to pitch up by delta theta. This would then be the increase in incidence due to the lift multiplied by the by the static sorry by the elastic margin. Okay, so this would be the lift dependent pitching moment. We can, we can sort of appreciate how this is going to occur. Now we sort of spoke about this at the start of the course already. So we're gonna get into this and we're gonna produce a mathematical model for this in the lectures that are coming probably next week that are gonna be looking at torsional divergence and control reversal. So this idea of static aeroelasticity, at least for wings, is sort of easy to intuit and easy to sort of figure out. Things become more difficult if we have un if we have dynamic motion on our aircraft. So static deformation is relatively 
easy to understand. But deformation doesn't occur in an infinitesimal amount of time. If we have a changing load on our aircraft, then that's going to cause the wing to bend up in a finite amount of time, or bend down in a finite amount of time, or twist up, twist down in a finite amount of time. And that motion, if we have the aircraft wing going up and down, we call that plunging. It's plunging is positive if it goes down, it would be negative plunge if it goes upwards. So when these deformations occur because of changing loads, they cause the aircraft wing to move with respect to the free stream, or with respect to the air around it. So we see this sort of flapping motion that can occur that gives rise to inertial effects and aerodynamic effects. We'll say, however, any change in load will give rise to dynamic structural motion. And this causes change to aerodynamic loads and it causes a set of inertial loads to occur. So we're going to look at the, aer the aerodynamic loads first. So let's look at our aircraft wing again. Let's look at this cross section. Let's try and draw an aerofoil properly. It's remarkably difficult to draw an aerofoil as a smooth curve on an iPad. I think I'd have a hang of it by now. So let's say this is our cross section through our aircraft wing. And that's aligned to my chord line. And I've got my aircraft velocity U approaching the aircraft wing at the angle of attack alpha. So let's say this is our undisturbed case. Okay, let's say for whatever reason there's been a, a gust or some other sort of perturbation that causes the lift to reduce on the wing. So let's say I've got my aircraft and these are my wings. Let's say they're both bent up because of lift on the wings okay so the aircraft wings will bend upwards under aircraft load under, under the fact that the wings are producing lift if there's a sudden drop in lift then they're going to bend down somewhat okay because they want to fall downwards with respect to their own inertial so with respect to their own stiffness within the wings and to, due to the fact the wings themselves have mass so if there's a perturbation that causes a reduction in lift is going to cause the wings to have a positive plunge velocity. So let's go over here and say some aero perturbation that's causing a reduction in lift. We have a reduction in lift, we therefore have the wing plunges and the wing is going to plunge through the plunge displacement which we give the symbol H. Okay, so for example my wing, my aerofoil section might go from this position to this position. It's just gone from being up here to being down here through that plunge displacement H. Then let's draw this on over here. Let's, let's, say, let's say over here, okay? So it's plunged down 
at this velocity h, which means that there's going to be an airflow relative to the plunge mode to the plunge displacement, and that's going to have size h dot, where h is dot is defined as dh on dt. So the time rate of change of the plunge deformation gives us something called the plunge velocity. So that plunge velocity causes an effective upwash to occur. Causes an effective upwash. And what's that going to cause to our aircraft problem over here? Well, the aerodynamic angle of attack due to the angle made between the free stream velocity and the chord line isn't going to change, but we are going to have this extra velocity term here. Where we've got h dot, and that's actually going to cause u to approach the aircraft at this angle here. So let's get rid of this one here. We've got this second angle, which we're going to call theta. Theta is simply equal to the arc tangent of h dot divided by u, which for small angles is equal to h dot on u here. So this is the disturbed case. Now it's important to note that what we're looking at here, this condition here, is a snapshot in time during that motion. So same old wings are bent up heavily, then if the, if the aircraft lift is reduced, they're gonna go down. Now what has happened here is I've gone, let's say halfway down, I've taken a snapshot of what's occurring. So halfway down, I've got this velocity that's, that's going upwards towards the underside of the wing, and we give that the symbol H dot because it's time rate of change of that plunge displacement, dh on dt, and that gives rise to this angle theta, and this causes the angle of attack of the section to increase. So we can see here, if the plunge displacement, and hence h dot, is greater than zero, which means the wing is going downwards, the wing plunges down as a consequence that angle theta which is the effective upwash okay because the aircraft is that the wing is then going downwards theta is going to be greater than zero no theta is greater than zero I should put there so then this total angle in here that the velocity now makes with the aircraft wing is going to be equal to theta, sorry, theta plus the original angle of attack. So let's call this angle theta prime. And so we can see what happens here that if our aircraft wing has a tendency, if it bends down, then what's that going to cause? It's going to cause an increase to the angle of attack. So we've got this thing occurring here. If we have an increase to the angle of attack, that's going to cause an increase to the lift, which is going to cause the aircraft wing to have a tendency to bend back up again. So what that means is that this is an aerodynamic damping to bending motion. If I have a plunging vibration, then that's going to always give rise to an aerodynamic force in the opposite direction to that plunging motion. No, let's use the yellow one. So if the angle of attack is getting larger, CL is going to increase, 
causes a force opposing H. Okay, and a very similar reasoning can be done if the aircraft has an increase in lift causing the wing to bend upwards. Then at any instant in time, there's going to be an effective downwash on the wing, which causes a reduction in angle of attack, which causes a decrease in lift, which causes a tendency or a force causing a downwards bending deformation. So this shows the aerodynamic forces associated with dynamic wing bending are positively damped. And all that means is that the, li the lift that's produced due to the motion of aircraft bending vibration will cause the bending vibrations to be smaller in magnitude. And it means this is positively damped. And this sort of makes sense if you think about what's going on here. If you get a ruler and shake it about, you can feel that. You can feel that you're sort of trying there's two separate effects. There's almost like a, there's a, there's an impulsive effect you're trying to push air away, but also we see this thing that it changes the angle of attack, which we've got going on here. Okay, so you can use this very similar reasoning to see that when we have upwards motion, we have the exact same thing occurring. So we've just brought this in here to give this idea of the sort of problems that we need to look at in dynamic aeroelasticity whenever we have any motion occurring due to structural deformations that take finite time to occur. We've also got one more thing that occurs that, well, there's many more things that occur, but we've got one more thing we're going to look at that makes dynamic aeroelasticity more complicated. So the wing also has an inertial resistance to acceleration. which you might be more comfortable with me saying as mass. The aircraft wing has a mass, but it's important to put it in this, in this sense. The aircraft wing has an inertial resistance to acceleration because it shows us what's going to happen on our aircraft wing. And that focus doesn't really matter though. So let's think about what happens now if we have that plunge velocity occurring. Sorry, not plunge velocity. Let's think about what happens if we have a plunge acceleration now. So if we have a plunge acceleration, this gives rise to inertial forces. Let's see if that refocuses. Let's see if I can get me back in. Actually, I don't care. I don't need to be in focus for you guys. Okay, so let's draw our aircraft wing. Now, this time we've got an acceleration. Let's say we have a plunge acceleration. And we're gonna give this the symbol H double dots. I'm really bad at drawing H's, lowercase H's, which is kind of weird because it's the first letter in my name. They look like L's when I draw them sometimes. We have this plunge deformation H double dots. And let's just draw in here. Let's, what color did I draw the elastic axis earlier? Elastic axis I drew in green. So let's draw the elastic axis here. And I drew in the, inertial axis in blue. 
So let's draw the center of gravity here. I'm going to give it with the sort of symbol that we normally give the center of gravity. I'll call this either the inertial axis or the CG. If the aircraft is pushed downwards because of a change to the forces on the wing, then that's going to cause a force because of Newton's second law to occur here. That's going to be M, or well, F is equal to MA or M multiplied by H double dot from Newton's second law. So what's that going to cause? Well, that's going to cause a torsion to occur because there's now a moment arm between the torsional center of the wing and the force that's just occurred because of this plunge deformation and the associated reaction force on the center of mass of this section. So we say unless EA and IA are coincident, a torsional moment occurs. And we can probably appreciate that for this case, if this aircraft wing was to suddenly bend downwards, let's pretend it was, this was bending motion, it was suddenly bent downwards, then that would cause this force upwards on the inertial axis, and that would then cause the wing to have a tendency to bend nose down or leading edge down of this wing. So we are going to develop a model for an aircraft wing to help us look at um, in fact, we're not going to look at these dynamic phenomena, thankfully, because if we were to build, if we were to incorporate these into our aircraft model wing that we're going to use, then it becomes just a little bit too complicated for this level that we're at in this course. Okay, but I want you guys to just have an appreciation of where this course could go if I was to run it the full aeroelasticity course and the problems that you guys are going to face. But we are going to develop a, an aircraft wing model and we're going to use it to look at static aeroelastic phenomenon. Before we get there though, we are going to do a worked example on panel flutter. So we're going to go through a panel flutter example because that enables me to go through some of the dynamic phenomena without having to invoke unsteady aerodynamics and still getting to use things like work energy methods, virtual work methods, and then a, a matrix method or a finite element method to come up with a solution for that problem. And then we're gonna look at how we solve it, how we look at the um, free vibration response, and if we can predict the speed at which flutter occurs. Now that example we're gonna go through is gonna be probably quite confusing and complicated for a lot of you. Um, let's just go through it and see where we get. Okay, I can't test too heavily on this panel flutter example, but I will expect you guys to understand it and to answer similar questions based around it. And then in the next two following weeks, we're going to look at torsional divergence and control reversal, and you will be expected to answer numerical questions about those problems. Right, I hope everyone's having a wonderful day, wonderful weekend. I will see you guys twice more in terms of lectures this week and a review on the Wednesday. Take care, guys. Have a lovely night.